I'd like to welcome everyone to our third in our series of Stanford Facial Plastic Surgery webinars. Um, it is uh, my pleasure to host our group of uh, internationally known speakers. Uh, just as a quick reminder, we have several uh, more uh, webinars coming up. And just as a quick preview, uh, next week is um, going to be uh, a group uh, that's known for non-Caucasian rhinoplasty. Uh, one of those speakers is actually with us this week, that's Nazim. So thank you for doing it two weeks in a row, Nazim. Um, I will be both thank you. <laughs> but, uh, but let me introduce the speakers this week. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Nazim Circus from uh, Turkey, Dr. Dean Toriyumi from the US in Chicago, Dr. Rod Rorick uh, from the US in Dallas, Dr. Hossam Foda joining us from Egypt, and Dr. Enrico Robati uh, coming from Italy, Northern Italy. I wanna thank all of you so much for taking time out of your mornings, afternoons, evenings, whatever it is where you are in this part of the world uh, to share with us your expertise. Um, I'm just gonna do a really brief intro about one little topic that, that's near and dear to my heart that we're gonna, we're gonna get going uh, with, our, with our talks. And that is really the importance of the tip tripod um, in revision rhinoplasty. Um, and I'm gonna, in the, in the, for the sake of brevity, not get into videos or anything, but just wanna show a couple of things. Um, and this is my contact information. And I'm gonna show a couple of, a couple of cases, um, not the actual videos in the, in the interest of time and just show how really just one aspect of revision, and there's so many aspects to revision rhinoplasty, but one aspect in each of these cases was so important. And in this case, uh, as you can see, among other things, he has a very droopy tip and it lengthens his nose, as well as a few other issues, and particularly the loss of uh, his dorsum. Uh, and simple tripod reconstruction is where I always start my revision cases. Uh, and the concept is essentially that of Jack Anderson, and that is the tripod concept of the nose, uh, the tip uh, rotation and, and projection, and simply replacing that tip support that this patient had lost and rotating his tip back into the proper uh, projection and rotation made a big difference. And, uh, and this is the, the Gunter diagram that I used for this patient, but in particular, using tongue and groove, septal splinting, and lateral curl overlay to get that tripod in the right position uh, was uh, very important. And of course, the, the tongue and groove method's been around for a while, and Hossam uh, and Russ Cridell were two of the people that wrote one of the uh, most seminal papers on it uh, several years ago. And this is the patient afterwards. Now, there are a number of things done to him to fix his mid-vault and his dorsum, but simply placing his tip back in the right position with strong support, which was lacking in the original rhinoplasty, uh, was very important for his results. And it's not always about uh, shortening. Uh, this is another one where the tip support had been lost. This is a, another case of shortening the, though. Uh, and there's tip asymmetry, droopy tip. There's certainly the excess anterior septal angle and other things going on. But really replacing the anterior septum, which was severely deviated as Dean and, other, and others have talked about was very important for her to both improve her breathing and set the tripod in the right position, again, with the tongue and groove. Uh, and here she is afterwards uh, on her front view uh, her three quarters view, uh, one of the profile views, as you can see that tip supports much better and her base view, and of course, uh, up close frontal view, showing the dorsal aesthetic lines uh, restored, but mostly that excess infratip lobule and asymmetry of the infratip lobule and infratip area uh, improved. Uh, as I was starting to say earlier, it's not always about shortening. In some cases, uh, noses have been overshortened and you need to lengthen them. Uh, and in this case, setting that tip tripod in the right position was again the first step in this uh, young lady's reconstruction. In this case, it was septal extension grafting in order to set that tip back into the correct position. Often the soft tissue envelope is one of the main issues in these patients. Luckily, hers was forgiving enough to allow me to place the tip in the right position. Uh, and simple septal, septal extension grafting allowed me to do that for her. One thing that was unique about her case uh, was that she was completely missing her lateral cura. They'd been completely resected. All that was left were her domes and her medial cura. Uh, and there we go. Uh, so this is an intraoperative view showing the, the domes present and nothing lateral to those. Uh, and the lateral curl replacement crafts, which were then repositioned. Uh, I'm just gonna show one real short video. I know I said I wasn't, but I forgot I had one little short one in here. Uh, showing how I like to do this. Now, this isn't uh, that patient, but uh, now I often use a 6700 blade to do this dissection rather than a scissor. But rather than simply trust that that precise pocket is going to be enough, I often like to place uh, PDS sutures into the grafts. 
uh, and then place them in the right position. Here I am measuring to make sure that they're going to be in the right position. As I said, this isn't the same patient, so this is more a lateral curl repositioning, but the same, uh, same type of method is used. I'm gonna skip past the securing part, but this is placing PDS sutures in the distal end. So this is a 4-0 double arm PDS suture. And rather than use two through it nowadays, I simply pass one with a knot on the end in order to catch the end of the lateral cruise and then place it into the pocket. And this uh, is a very nice technique for making sure that it stays in that inferior position exactly where you want it. And once it's passed into there, you tie it with a Webster suture so you don't strangulate the skin at that point. Uh, and then simply clip those sutures uh, at the one week point so that it's sitting in that position you don't have to worry about removing any sutures. So it's a nice little trick I just thought I'd show. So here she is uh, uh, one year out. All these uh, photos are at least one year out. Uh, she's doing quite well. There's a very minor tip asymmetry, uh, but the nasal lengthening was uh, to me impressive given the amount of shrinkage she'd had previously. And I think perhaps because she's a younger patient and it had only been about 16 months post her first surgery when I did the revision uh, that she did much better. Here's her uh, up close frontal view. Another uh, patient whose tip ha had been uh, also completely removed uh, and her lateral curl removed. So she was also missing her domes in this case. So it had to be completely reconstructed. Similar technique used. Here she is over a year out with a total tip reconstruction and lateral ailer and tripod reconstruction. So you can see the improved definition she had there. In both of these cases, I had no idea how much cartilage was going to be missing. So it was a, kind of a surprise. And that's one of the things about revision rhinoplasty uh, that makes it quite so challenging. This is the close frontal view. And finally, in some cases, uh, the tip is completely missing. Uh, this uh, patient had had uh, revision rhinoplasty multiple times and actually had a rib graft placed with K-wires. One had become infected and come through his tip. So he lost his tip skin and he was traveling around the, the country actually looking for someone to fix him. And when I saw him, I told him uh, basically that he needed a forehead flap. Um, and so we did a, essentially a four stage surgery. The first stage was simply removing the infected uh, material. Uh, the second stage was the forehead flap recreating the skin envelope. Uh, and so this is where you have to trust your, your instincts that, um, that the, the uh, soft tissue uh, landmarks are going to be adequate and hidden enough when you place this forehead flap in there in a cosmetic case. So you have to have your patients trust that this is gonna look okay in the end. Uh, here he is with this, this had about a nine millimeter pedicle. So it's a very narrow forehead flap. Uh, of course, there's a second stage uh, surgery, which was done a couple of weeks later. Uh, and then the revision, uh, formal revision with uh, tip support engaged uh, and underneath that done with a standard external approach. And that skin actually does fine once it's revascularized if you wait six to nine months uh, postoperatively. And here he is after that reconstruction with his tip back. And there's no way you could do that without replacing that skin. I don't think a skin graft would have done the same thing for him. Here's his frontal view and you can see his forehead uh, is actually healed quite well. So for me, when I do revision rhinoplasty, I always start with the septum and the tip tripod complex. We're gonna hear uh, from our uh, remaining speakers, um, various aspects of revision, including some aspects of this. Uh, again, I want to thank them all uh, for joining us today, Nazem, Dean, Rod, Osam, and Enrico. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Nazem, who will share screen as soon as I stop. And Nazem is coming to us from his boat in southern Turkey. Thank you, Nazem. Thank you, Sam, for inviting me uh, to this panel. Uh, I'm happy to, to be part of this panel with uh, my dear friends, uh, Roth, Dean, Enrico, Hossam. It's a pleasure and honor for me. And I'm, I'm having my holiday and I hope my connection is fine and uh, you, you are able to see uh, my slides well and the video. I hope my video is gonna work as well. So. I, I do a lot of uh, secondary surgeries and uh, the most of the cases I operate, these are my disclosures. The, this kind of over-resected uh, difficult noses, I actually enjoy operating them because every case is another challenge. Uh, I, I like to operate the challenging cases. And the most complex uh, secondary rhinoplasty cases are the ones that 
uh, whom the structural elements of the nose were over resected. And there are actually three main uh, components of this surgery. The first one is the septum reconstruction. Without a stable septum, we cannot achieve a, a, a result, good result. And the second part is the tip reconstruction and uh, if necessary, dorsum augmentation. This, uh, additional to that, of course, we have to uh, work for the no uh, bones and you know the other parts of the nose and the ailer bases as well. I use a rib cartilage in the major, vast majority of those cases. Rib offers unlimited amount of cartilage and it's the graft of choice when the significant reconstruction and augmentation is required. I described harvesting the rectus abdominis fascia. I'm using dice cartilage fascia grafting for dorsum augmentation. And uh, if I will use uh, dice cartilage fascia grafting or this fascia can be also used for camouflaging the dorsal irregularities. I first harvest the rectus abdominis fascia. Then I harvest the seventh rib. In most of the cases, I don't need that much cartilage. In those cases, I harvest the lower part, lower two third of the rib cartilage instead of uh, harvesting the whole rib cartilage. Then, and uh, in this way, uh, I can preserve the continuity of the rib. And uh, I observed that uh, post-operative pain is less comparing the full rib harvest. So then the segmenting of the rib cartilage should be done on the anterior posterior direction. Usually we need three or five uh, cartilage struts and uh, they are uh, segmented using a dermatome blade or, or 20 or 11 gauge, uh, ele number 11 uh, blade. And we prepare this struts. And uh, this struts will be used for uh, septum reconstruction and uh, either cartilage reconstruction. Septum L strut reconstruction is the first and uh, vital step of the surgery. Without a stable and straight dorsum, uh, the result will not be satisfactory. So, but the, one of the most challenging uh, cases are the ones whom the dorsal septum is completely resected or destroyed. In that case, the uh, dorsal stress uh, should be fixed to the nasal bones. This is the only, uh, only option. So in that case, I drill hole to, to nasal bones and uh, place the uh, dorsal struts or whatever you call it, we can call it spreader grafts. Usually in those cases, only one graft to, to between the nasal bones is advanced and fixated. To, to compensate the dorsal asymmetry, another spreader graft, it can be placed to the other side mm -hmm. and the caudally, a caudal septal extension graft is placed. Here, here I'm showing the, the technique. I drill hole uh, with a hand drill. Uh, of course, you can use uh, a, a power drill for that, but with hand drill, uh, in a few seconds, I can drill holes to, to nasal bones. So then the dorsal strut is placed between the nasal bones and fixed to the, to the nasal bones. This is a little bit technically difficult maneuver, but it, it is the only method to fixate the, the dorsal strut to the uh, nasal dorsum. There is no other option in those cases. So uh, it is 
sometimes difficult to find the second hole on the other side. So first come out between the uh, cartilage graft and the, and the bones and uh, find the other hole on the other side. I use here 40 PDS and to the in this case to the left side another spreader graft will be placed will be sutured and uh, and then uh, to caudal septal extension graft will be placed this is this kind of case 33 years old patient who had a close rhinoplasty 11 years ago and she has an over resected dorsum over resected alar cartilage over shortened nose due to the resection and the destroy, uh, destroyed uh, septum cartilage, over resection of the septum cartilage. So you can see here the inverted V deformity as well as uh, tip cartilage were over resected. So when we look at the patient from the base, you can see that she has, uh, he has particularly uh, depression and pinching on the right side due to resection of the alar cartilage. So the surgical goals of this patient is reconstruction of the L strut, elongation of overshortened nose, and the reconstruction of the tip tripod, and the correction of the asymmetric nostrils and the augmenting the dorsum. So when I opened the nose, what I saw that the septum cartilage were totally uh, destroyed and there was no septum cartilage at all. Right domal segment was, was resected, but left domal segment was present. Uh, and uh, right lower lateral cura uh, was totally resected. The left uh, lower lateral was also resected. So what I did in this case, I harvested the seven trip cartilage, prepared five strut grafts. Uh, the dorsal uh, struts were uh, fixed to the uh, nasal bones in a more anterior position to raise the dorsum. Uh, upper lateral cartilage remnants were sutured to the uh, dorsal struts and the caudal septal extension graft was placed uh, between the, uh, the dorsal struts and, uh, and L strut reconstruction was performed. Then uh, for the tip reconstruction, to the left side, uh, there was a dome, seg dome segment was uh, present. And uh, so underneath the domal segment, a ladder cura strut graft was placed but on the right side, uh, there was no doma segment. In that case, from the soft part of the uh, rib cartilage, a, a dome reconstruction uh, was done. Uh, from the softer part of the rib cartilage, uh, a piece of graft was sutured to the medial cura remnant, and that is banded. And underneath that, a ladder cura strut graft is placed. And uh, this is the, uh, an, another cartilage graft, which is fairly soft from the outer layer of the rib cartilage. Underneath of that, there is a, an, a, a, another graft, a ladder cura strut graft. And uh, this tripod reconstruction was performed with this way. This, uh, this method uh, I learned from uh, Dean. Uh, if there is a ladder cura remnant, I use ladder cura remnant, but in this case, there was no ladder cura remnant for dome reconstruction. And the ladder cura strut graphs are uh, placed and sutured to under surface of, the, uh, of this graft. So then for the dorsum augmentation, uh, using rectus abdominis fascia, a dice cartilage fascia graft it was prepared and uh, placed to the dorsum. 
And uh, this is the 12 months post-op to patient. And uh, on the dorsum, uh, inverted V deformity is corrected. The dorsal aesthetic lines are refined. And uh, on the side view, uh, a pretty good dorsal augmentation is achieved. And the nose el elongation is achieved. And the retracted columella uh, is corrected. And uh, this is the oblique view of the patient. And uh, this is the basal view of the patient. And uh, you can see the nostrils are pretty good symmetricized and uh, a, a nice tip tripod is achieved. Uh, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much uh, for listening to me. Thank you very much, uh, Nazim. And again, thank you for taking time out of your uh... Your time off to uh, share with us from your from your boat. Fantastic case, very difficult, and um, you know I I, uh, I always learn something uh, when I hear you and, and our rest of our panelists speak. We had one question from the audience, and I have a question. Um, do you ever try um, Do you ever try oblique cutting the rib obliquely to see if you can reduce warping? If you don't get as much length, and Dr. Uh, I, I, taught me that. I tried that. I tried that. Uh, but with uh, oblique cut, I cannot achieve, I cannot get a longer stretch. That's right. Uh, when, yeah. when, when I harvest the, the lower part of the rib, seven rib, seven rib is relatively straight. And it is not a problem for me warping because my, uh, I usually need longer graphs. In some cases, even up to four centimeters. Mm -hmm. With the oblique cut, I can only uh, provide two and a half, maximum three centimeters. If the dorsal stress, dorsal defect is, is significant in that case, I need longer spreader graphs. That's, that's actually exactly the thing that I've run into. I think that the length that you can get is limited. Also, the AP, the, the width, uh, depending on the rib, how wide the rib is, and if you cut it obliquely, you might end up with, <clears throat> excuse me, very narrow pieces. I'm wondering if any of the other panelists have any comments about that. So seventh advantage of the seventh trip, it is uh, wider than the sixth trip. That's mm -hmm. why I, I prefer to use seventh trip. I used to use sixth trip in the past and I, you know, converted to the seventh trip. I'm, I'm very happy with that. And I think, I think uh, our next speaker, Dean's gonna talk more about rib too. Uh, what, one question for all the panelists that came from the audience was, um, how do you judge, uh, or do you judge exactly how much lengthening you can get with that soft tissue envelope in the overshortened nose when you put it in an SCG? Well, it depends on the on the skin. You know how much skin you can, how much you can stretch the skin. Right. And actually, the short noses are the most dangerous ones. You know, most risky ones in terms of the skin compromise. So in my life, I had three cases with the skin compromise and uh, all of them were short noses. Right. Anyone else have any comments about it? I find the same thing, you know, I think younger patients tend to do a little better. The length, the, the amount of time uh, since the surgery where they were shortened makes a difference. Um, Rick uh, Davis has talked about, and others I'm sure have talked about massaging I don't know, it might be a voodoo, but it maybe helps loosen things up. I don't know. I do have patients do that. It makes me feel better. Uh, Rod yeah, and Dean. Yeah, me too. I, I, I've actually started doing the massage. Um, you know, I did a short nose yesterday. I think I put a septal extension graft in. I actually make it longer than I know I can, I can get, but I maximize it, and then I trim it back a little bit on the septal mm -hmm. extension. And, uh, you know, the younger patient, especially if it's, if it's not, a, if, if they've been well vascularized and if they have thicker skin, you know, just at the end of the case, you know, they, they can't have white at the tip. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's, it's, those are challenges and I, I undermine them and those are challenging cases. Great result, Nazim. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else want to comment? I see everyone is unmuted. <clears throat> Okay, I guess not. So in, the, in that case, we'll move on. So I'll ask all the panelists to mute for now and we'll let uh, Dr. Toriyumi speak. Uh, Dean, welcome. Thank you for coming to, uh, to join us here and um, stopping your bass fishing. This Thank you, Dean. That's a wonderful uh, presentation as usual. And um, 
Yeah, I have a couple of questions, and I think there's some questions for the audience for all of us. Um, I think that, you know, one thing that I, I pick up something from you guys every time, and, and do you find it's really reliable to, um, to carve the uh, cartilage such that you have perichondria on one side and get reliable uh, amount of warping to place those as lateral curl replacements? That, because I think that's a wonderful idea to get that curvature. One of the problems is if you put a straight graft there, you're creating this triangular rather than a domal structure at the, at the valve, and so it's really nice. Um, so can you just tell me your experience with that? Is it pretty reliable that if you wait a while, it will stay at that? Will it curve more? Will it stay right there? Yeah, so what I've found is, see the problem I've had in prior years is that I would take a piece of cartilage that's about 30 millimeters long, and then I would put it in as a lateral curl strut graft, and then one graft would be like this, and the other graft would be like this, mm -hmm. post-op. One side, the airway's blocked, the other side, the airway's open the tips flat on the other side the other side it's not and that's because that graft that was concave facing medially flipped on me mm -hmm. and i find that very frustrating so what i found was if i leave the native perichondrium on one side that kind of stabilizes one surface and keeps the curvature in 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 this orientation i want now, if it's a young patient, you may get a real dramatic curvature. So in that case, I just cross, cross hatch the perichondrium and possibly splint it. Um, I'd rather have slightly more curvature with concave facing medially than for that graph to flip around where it's concave in the opposite direction. So in other words, concave going out Mm -hmm. uh, and then you get the graft pushing into your airway, creating airway obstruction and visibility. That to me is a real big problem requiring revision surgery. So that's why I've gone to this. The other thing I found is, and we're, we're going to do it, you know, we're planning on doing a study on this. I think by leaving the perichondrium on the cartilage, you do three things. Number one is you increase the rate of vascularization. So it protects your graft. Even if you get infection, it helps protect your graft. But the other thing is, I think that rib is more stable once it's in the patient with the perichondrium on it, because I think it feels a little bit more comfortable because it's, it's at home with its little native perichondrial covering on the one side, and I think it stabilizes it. So in other words, I'm seeing less late bending with the perichondrium on it once you put it in the patient. So that's why I have the one surface that has the native perichondrium on it, the other surface, the other segment, I chop up into smaller grafts without the perichondrium, and I use the perichondrial, the native perichondrial side for the lateral curl strut grafts. I noticed that, um, and I think I know the answer to this question, but so the perichondrium helps stabilize it. You think that's even the case when you suture it to it, as you do on those dorsal grafts, you suture it to the bottom surface so yeah. it stabilizes it. Okay. Yeah, so with the dorsal thing, I suture it to the dorsal graft, and then that allows me to get, um, uh, an osseous bond between the, the, the graft and the dorsum. I know a lot of people like to have the comfort of using the, the DCF. I personally don't like DCF. I want to set exactly where I want my, my dorsal aesthetic lines. I can carve a single segment of cartilage, put the perichondrium in the undersurface, and, and let me tell you, at two weeks, you put your finger up here and you cannot move that graft. It's, it's literally ossified to the dorsum. Mm -hmm. So if it's ossified, it's not going to bend. And, and that's my premise. And, and, and I like to carve, you know, I, I don't like to chop. I like to carve. I think you're an exceptional carver, Dean. I don't know. Probably, I don't know. I certainly can't match your carving ability. Maybe other people on this panel can. But um, one question I have from the, from the audience was, uh, were you using micro or nano fat grafting? You kind of really briefly showed that. <clears throat> I use a lot of fat in secondaries. I use nano fat if I'm concerned about vascularization. So any patient who's got vascularly compromised skin, I'll take either temporal fascia or costal perichondrium, infuse the nano fat into it. And then if I want thickening, I'll use the micro fat. The nano fat is 400, 600 micron particles and the micro fats, larger particles with actual fat cells. And we actually did a study in, in, in mice and showed that when you infuse the fat or nano fat into the fascia, it actually becomes a composite graft of fascia and fat. So you actually are creating a subcutaneous fatty layer when you do that. 
And I, I, I am just shocked at how well it helps with vascularization of the skin envelope. In fact, I have a, if I have a large composite graft, I'll take a little strip of skin off the peripherally, leave the perichondrium on it, and I'll inject little small uh, area uh, of deposits of nanofat all the way around the graft into the perichondrium and then lay it in. And I think those little stem cells hanging out there help with the revascularization of that graft. That's really interesting. Yeah, I've heard you talk about that before. I'm glad we got a chance to ask that question. Um, any other comments from the panelists before we move on? I have a question, Dean. Yeah. About the, the composite graft that you, you just showed. It was a large composite graft from the ear. Did you graft the donor site or did you close it primarily or what did you do? Yeah, so if, if it's a fusiform <clears throat> graft that's less than two millimeters or three millimeters in, in, in width, I'll close with a subcutaneous 5 PDS and then fast absorbing gut for the skin. Anything bigger than that, I take a skin graft from the back of the ear, take the subcutaneous fat on it, suture it in place, and then put a cotton in front and behind the ear and suture it with a 3 black nylon. And I leave that cotton in for two weeks. If the patient's from out of town, I'll clip the knot, leave the cotton there, and then the patient, I tell the patient that cotton will fall out in another five or six days, but don't pull it out. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? All right. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Rod Rorick, who's going to who's coming to us from Texas, and he's going to share with us his experience with a particular uh, pearl here. Dead space closure. Thanks. Thanks unmute. So much. As usual, uh, great. You have to unmute. Yep. Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, okay. Right. All, uh, all the other panelists could just make sure you mute, please. Yeah. So, um, you know, obviously, revision rhinoplasty is a completely different operation. These are my disclosures. I write books and do research. And of course, uh, we had the honor and pleasure of, of hosting the last meeting of uh, the U in the USA on rhinoplasty. <laughs> And uh, Dean was there. It was kind of an eerie experience. And actually, I recently did a webinar on uh, on rhinoplasty live. So this is a case I'm going to present uh, a little later. And basically, you know, it epitomizes all the problems we have in tertiary and revision rhinoplasty. But before I do that, I just kind of want to show uh, why rhinoplasty, revision rhinoplasty is so hard. You know, it's all the things that uh, have been presented, the scar tissue contraction, the loss of the framework, and then the subsequent problems you have. And it's really the biggest problem we have is how wounds heal because when you're done with uh, sculpting it, you know, it's un un unlike artists where they're done with their granite, it stays, the wound healing is unpredictable. So how do you transcend that and make it so that you can make it more predictable? How do you take this glob from a vision and make it pristine like in a, in a patient that has, a, when you open it from a primary rhinoplasty? You know, that's your goal. So it's all about framework restoration and dead space closure. To me, dead space closure and how you resolve that is really pivotal. And how you stabilize and restore the framework is, is also pivotal. So you stay deep, reserve the soft tissue. If you violate soft tissue skin, game over. Minimize the resection of scar tissue and normalize nasal function. And I think the other thing that's important is these five things, which I think are cardinal rules for me in, in revision rhinoplasty to getting more consistent results. It's meticulous hemostasis, TXA, transamic acid use, um, sandwich splints, closure dead space, membranous septum closure, tip suspension sutures, and soft tissue triangle. Let me go through them real quick. Um, TXA, I love this. I, I, give, I give this, I give a gram to every patient, every face and every nose. I give at least a gram uh, at induction along with antibiotics and, and aid of decadron. And then intraoperatively, I mix uh, epinephrine with transamic acid uh, so that when I'm getting hemostasis throughout the operation, uh, I make sure everything's dry. And I do this also at the time of closure because anytime you get rid of blood, you can actually make, I think you, you minimize your chances for scar formation. And then sidewall, and, and Dean mentioned that, and I think everybody does that. Whenever I manipulate the sidewall, or if I'm done and I, my ailer rim, even if I'm doing a dual ailer contragraft and it's still not perfect, I'll do a sandwich closure of that and I'll leave it for 10 days, seven to 10 days. The key is 
you got to make sure they're spaced adequately apart and you can put your, your brownettes beneath it. Uh, I think that's so pivotal. Um, and then closure of dead space, especially since we use, all of us use a lot of septal extension grafts. Closing that dead space not only reinforces that you keep the tip where you want it, but more importantly, it also maintains it so that you can, what you see is what you get, including the, the, the repair of the, of the medial foot plates. That's very, very important. And then sometimes in, in patients that really have thick skin, I don't defat as much anymore as what I do is I actually I do a super tip um, subdermal suspension suture and I'll actually use the remnant of, of, uh, of the ligament of structures that's left there. And I found that to be much better than defatting the skin. And then lastly, I do soft tissue triangle, internal and external splinting. What do I mean by that? I, I use external, internal splinting with a butterfly graft because the soft tissue triangle, even in great results, I see notching. So I use a soft tissue from the cephalic trim or even a morselized uh, cartilage from the septum to the buttress that internal soft tissue triangle. And then I never close the soft tissue triangle inside, but I've, I use Surgicil and Bacterban to absorb that blood that's left there and I leave it in place. And then of course the molding externally is important too. I actually, I think it's molding to put, put it on, whether you want to get a super tip break or not, I think that's very important to mold that. Put on your little splints. Uh, I'm in the process of making a new Denver splint, which I think is uh, much better to be molding than this. And then, then just put it all together. And, and even doing that, it's, it can be a challenge, as you know. So here's this lady, you know, multiple rhinoplasties, previous, uh, previous rib graft, ear cartilage graft. And I'm, I feel like uh, a Dean also, I don't like ear cartilage graft, so I don't even, I don't use it anymore. And I know Hassan's going to prove us wrong. But um, mid-vault collapse, asymmetry, polybeak, ailer notching bilaterally. Um, and and uh, internal external nasal valve couldn't breathe, uh, excess infotiplob you'll show, polybeak deformity. So what was the plan? Uh, open approach, spreader, spreader flaps, uh, spreader grafts from fresh frozen rib grafts, unilateral left more than right, septal extension grafts, cap grafts, extended ailer contour grafts, butterfly grafts, uh, ailer uh, equalization sutures. Um, I like to use a fixed mobile septal extension graft. In this case, it was built on the on the side of one of the rib grafts. And it, I like this because it everything's so fixed in revision rhinoplasty, but if you can do a, a stable fixed mobile one off the edge of the uh, septal angle or of your previous spreader graft, you can make it so it's a little more natural because people hate it when they come in and they have the total rib, the total rigid tip. So cap graft from scar, butterfly graft, extended ailer contour graft. And this just happens, this is sometimes in, uh, and I do this a lot in primaries and secondaries. I'll do an, an ailer, um, an ailer uh, uh, suture where I'm doing ailer equalization so that I can, uh, if, if I have asymmetry of the ailer rims, I can uh, place it and, and um, move it out. Um, here, I'm sorry. Um, I can move it out and, um, and actually get equalization of that area. This was actually from a different patient. And so I can, uh, Further ever at the lower the lower laterals and and that is a very powerful suture as well. Fixed ailer contour grafts, dual ailer contour grafts in the end. And this is um, this is this patient uh, use um, fresh frozen rib grafts. Um, and in this case, uh, we used a, a unilateral left extended rib graft, the right uh, spreader graft. I could reshape and mold. I sutured in a place to the remnants of the upper laterals and I sutured the upper laterals over the top of it. Then I've straightened it, I've reconstructed the mid vault uh, bilaterally, this is with 50 PDS. And then on the dorsum, I'll use uh, 40, 50 Vicryl, suture that into place, make sure my, uh, my, um, my dorsum is, is, is great. Then on the contralateral side, a fixed uh, septal extension graft place, then I'll use that as a pivot to do my tensioning of my lower lateral remnants, of course, of which they were uh, <clears throat> partially destroyed. Multiple sutures placed in here. And then, um, and then the placement of um, the four sutures to stabilize the septal extension graft. High, low intercural sutures, placement, tensioning of your remnants of your tips, transdomal sutures placed, and then, um, and then interdomal, 
and then I placed uh, morselized cartilage uh, from the um, from the the rib, and also some remnants from her septum. Sutured that into place, and then placed um, septal extension grafts in place. This patient had fairly thin skin. And then we placed uh, the butterfly graft and also a cap graft, placed the um, septal extension, ex extended ailer contour graft, and then dual ailer contour retrogrades at the end. So here she is after that. Uh, she's uh, animated, lateral view, face view. And she, you know, we, we, we fixed her both internal nasal valve, external nasal valve as well. Could have been a little bit stronger on the right side. And I had an extended ailer contrograph that was fixed there. So I think the, the big thing here that we all struggle with is, is scar tissue. And I think the key is to restore and stabilize the framework. I think that's what we all do. And when you restore function, I think that's important, but the, uh, the cosmetic restoration is important. And my goal is to always not make it so that they look good, but they also feel better too, because the biggest complaint I have in revision rhinoplasty is that, you know, they look good, but then they come back to say, Dr. Wright gets fine, but it's so stiff. I mean, I tell them about all that, but it's it's always been a challenge, and that's why I think the uh, the fixed floating um, septal extension graft has I think been a real help to me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rod. That's uh, really great. I, I have a question for you, and we have a couple of questions from the audience for for you and the, the other panelists. So the concept for dead space closure is this for more uh, just so I'm clear and so everyone's clear. Is it primarily to reduce short-term swelling and or is it more for long-term results to produce dead space scar tissue and, and so on? I think it's for both, Sam, because if you if you can close dead space, once you once you get heme in, in an area, I think it's game over. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've seen that's why I get meticulous hemostasis. And then if I have a dead space I can't close, like in the super tip, that's why I've, I've been back to doing the super tip. Uh, suture and I'm leaving, I'm actually not debulking as much as I used to. I'm actually just using that, you know, the Patangi ligament remnant to suture it down into place. And, um, and I think that really has been helpful. Um, I, I, really, I really think it's good for short and long-term. Because uh, if you have Makes blood, sense. You're, you, you're basically, it's game over again. Yeah, it totally makes sense. I mean, we do, we've been doing the same thing for the septum forever, right? We don't want that, want to leave that dead space. We always close that, put splints right. in there. I think your, your point about making sure that suture isn't too close is very important for everyone to understand so that you don't create an area of necrosis in the skin. So you notice Dr. Rorick put yeah. widely based sutures when he placed those in there so there's no pinching in any one single point and the, the force is distributed, uh, the pressure is distributed. So that's, that's a very, very important concept. Now, one thing that all of us that use rib you know, have shown um, is we often have to use bulky grafts, particularly the extended spreader grafts, as well as the caudal extension when we place them in there. For all the panelists, for Rod, Dean, uh, Nazim, you know, and myself, have you, have you ever seen that these actually great, give great form and structure, but they actually can cause some obstruction? I, I, absolutely. That's why I think the classic lateral curl strut graft did that when it was really highly placed. That's why, obviously, we're all putting it down further and further. And so, I mean, I, I, I think that if you don't place it properly, and Dean showed that in his illustration, uh, you can cause a lot of functional problems internally. I mean, but also the extended spreaders, too. I mean, those are, you know, we put those in there. They're, absolutely, they're huge absolutely. and they're sitting much and, uh, lower. Yes, you can do that. And, um, you know, in, in the secondaries, I fix them, too. I mean, I... I you know, they're a little harder to do, but I fix them. And then that's why I use dual ailer contour. I do retrograde sometimes too. I mean, I know you suture me in the place, which I think is a good idea and I may try that. But I actually, I sometimes, when I have a little remnant in I'll just put in a sliver uh, below that retrograde. And that seems to work well too. As long as, 
when you're done, it's got to be perfect. Because if there's any notching, it's only going to get about five times worse. Right. Dean or Enrico? Yeah. Nelson? Yeah. What, what I'll do is uh, toward the end of the case, I'll look in the nose. And if I see blockage from the inferior aspect of the spreader graft, all I do is go back up and then trim that bottom margin and just mm -hmm. round it out and flatten right. it. And then yeah. that'll open up the valve for you. So you just have to look at it. Uh, right. Because it, if it's a very deep spreader, you know, maybe five, six millimeters, then, or if it sits low in the mid vault, you can definitely block the valve. So you want to look at that defin definitely. And, and sometimes that's a good thing. Point goes, sometimes what happens is there's so much scar tissue. I'll take the scar tissue off. That's what's causing it. And if it's the scar tissue, then I then I laminate it with uh, with silicone sheeting. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? I have one concern about the silicon sheeting because I've seen a lot of complications from it. If you leave it for a long period of time and you have a tight suture, you just remove the silicon and there's a big slug in the skin. So well, it has to be very loosely sutured. That's my only concern. I mentioned that, Hazem, it's a good point. Now, remember, I put in two to three and, and I put my brown acids underneath it. It's got to be, if you can't put your brown acid underneath it, and they have to be widely spaced, you, if they're not widely spaced, at least five millimeters, you can have a problem. Now, knock on wood, and I, I, I take them out at, usually at seven days. Sometimes in really bad ones, I'll leave them longer, but you, you got to be careful. You're absolutely right, especially in, in, in thick e ethnic patients, because if you get a skin slough, that's a problem. You can use a little sterile strip just behind it. Yes. Right. I think so. Uh, one we have one question. Go ahead, Nazim. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, just a comment. You emphasized one very important thing, you know, the thickness of the graft. How thick graft I will use in which case? This is the biggest challenge to me. Right. You know, it's, and the skin envelope should redrape to the new uh, nasal skeleton. So adjustment of this red draping is the key for the success. Also, two big grafts. I, I had too many problems in the past with placement of two very thick ladder crag grafts, particularly large ladder crag grafts. They cause aesthetic deformity as well as internal nasal valve uh, obstruction, ob obstruction, obliterate the internal nasal valve, and I had to revise many cases. Right. The, the other thing I didn't talk about was that sometimes uh, if there's any mucosal redundancy, not so much in the, in the tertiary, sometimes if there's mucosal redundancy, especially in the distal part of the internal nasal valve, you got you to gotta fix that. Because if you don't fix that internal nasal valve uh, problem or that redundancy, uh, you know, you're going to have a worse problem. So I actually, I'll resect that mucosa. Excellent. We have we had one question for you, uh, Rod. One more question I wanted to make sure I got to, and that's um, how often do you use the uh, radiated frozen rib versus? It's, okay, it's not irradiated. I use it okay. about three, four times a week. Uh, okay. I I love it. I've used it almost six years. Uh, I I can tell you, I probably only do five or six uh, regular rib grafts anymore. The rest, you know, are I I actually I love it. I basically see patients that just don't want another rib graft. And uh, mm -hmm. I, um, so I, I think it, it's great. And it gives me a lot more versatility. Um, since so many of my patients are from out of town. So. Mm -hmm. Is that the MTF or is it a different, is it a it's local? MTF, yeah. yeah, it's not a radio, it's fresh frozen rib. It's totally okay. different. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I'm getting ready to put my data together on my you know, upcoming six year experience. And That'd be great. Look forward to seeing that. Okay, so we're gonna um, we're gonna now have a non-rib person show us how to do things. So it's my it's my pleasure to have Dr. Hossam Foda uh, join us from Egypt. Thank you. It's I know it's evening there, uh, and I'm gonna ask all the other panelists to put on mute for just a few minutes here for Hossam's uh, presentation. Thanks, Sam. And I'm the black sheep on this panel because I'm not using rib as much. But uh, I will present the case. Actually, I'm not giving a lecture. I'm presenting a specific case. She's 38 years old. She had one previous open rhinoplasty done in the States. 
and she was on antidepressants since then. And that's how the patient looks. And usually in these revisions, I will ask the patients from every view to list their concerns in the order of priority because I can't promise them to solve all the problems. So at least I will focus on the most important problems that they have. So in the frontal view, her order of uh, the sequence of importance was the flat asymmetric bones. The bone is bulging more on the right than the left, and it's pretty flat, over-resected. And the wide, ill-defined nasal tip. And she was very concerned about the flat infratip lobule. She thinks her nose is cut off. It doesn't look natural. And the excessive nostril show. So these were her main complaints from the frontal view. When we go to the lateral view, her main complaints were the low irregular nasal dorsum, because you can see the pretty much irregularity, and the over-rotated tip, the short nose, and the round tip with no definition. Now from the basal view, her concerns were the soft triangle facets, as you see, it's more pronounced on the right than on the left, and the asymmetric nostrils. So as long as I can agree with her concerns, we can go ahead and do the surgery, because some of them are concerned about minor things that won't be really solved. So the surgical plan, we need to augment the dorsum, we need to lengthen the nose, and we all know we need cartilage to do that. We can't depend on anything else. So we have septal cartilage, auricular cartilage, costal cartilage, and really that's the way I go. My first priority is septal cartilage. That's my first graft material of preference, followed by auricular and then followed by costal cartilage. So on average in a regular week, I would take at least five years in my cases. And in some of them, of course, I will combine both ears. And in this case, I had to take two ears because I needed to lengthen the nose and I needed to augment the nasal doors. So if I'm taking both ears, I will go one ear anterior and one ear posterior, and I will show you why. So I will take a curvilinear incision along the antihelical fold and the inferior cross of the antihelix. I will dissect the skin, and then I will cut the cartilage a couple of millimeters below the skin cut. That will give good support to the incision line, and the scar will be almost invisible. So you need that two millimeter of cartilaginous support. And then I will undermine the cartilage, and I will stop short of the posterior canal wall. I have to leave half a centimeter of cartilage behind the posterior canal wall in order to av avoid posterior canal wall sagging that I've seen a lot after conchoplasties. And then I will take the cartilage and the rest will be hemostasis and closure. As you see, the perichondrium is totally intact on one side of the cartilage, which is the posterior side, of course, because it's easier. Now, I will leave the assistant to close one side, which is anterior, and I will shift to the other ear and harvest the ear posteriorly. That way, the head of the patient can remain centered, and we will save time. Both ears would take less than 15 minutes. And I will take my incision posteriorly above the antihelic, uh, sorry, above the post-auricular crease, at least half a centimeter above it. The incisions which lie in the crease doesn't heal very well. So I will put it on the back of the conco. And then I will undermine the skin till I fall in the groove of the antihelical fold. I don't mark, I don't do methylene blue and needles, I don't do anything. This middle finger does everything because it monitors where the antihelical fold is. Once you reach this, I will start cutting with the 15 blade posterior to the antihelical fold. If you sacrifice the antihelical fold, you will cause an external deformity from the anterior aspect of the ear. 
And I always stress that the middle finger has to be in the conca when you cut the cortex. That way you will calibrate the amount of pressure you're putting on the 50, uh, with the 15 blade. If you cut the anterior skin, you deserve that your finger be cut as well. That's what I tell the residents. And then you will continue with the 15 blade and you will again preserve the half a centimeter cartilage from the posterior canal wall. And that's the amount you can get posteriorly from the cartilage. So we need to lengthen the nose. And for that, I do the replacement graft, which is a big graft. I have to double layer the cartilage to get one straight double layered ear cartilage graft. The perichondrium helps when it's intact on one side. So you can just split the cartilage and turn it into a sandwich technique, throw in some sutures, and you will get this piece of straight and double layered ear cartilage that you will use between the remnants of the medial crura, as you see. You go down to the anterior nasal spine, you will suture it to the medial crura. And then after that, I will put another layer of ear cartilage, like a cap graft, which I call the chapeau de Bonaparte, because that's the way it would look like after suturing, like Napoleon hat. And I leave it long enough here on both sides because this length will support at least the medial half of my alar rim. And it will support the soft tissue triangle as well. So that's the way it looks. And if I need further camouflage, I would put perichondrium from the ear. That's ear perichondrium, as you see. It's a thick layer that you can harvest because we harvest both ears. Now we are left the nasal dorsum that needs to be augmented. And in this case, as you see, I diced everything. So you get finer and finer dicing and you continue till you get the consistency that you want. Here we're getting close to it, which is finely diced cartilage, very finely diced cartilage. And then I will use my Offrecht retractor to pack the cartilage in and impact it. And then I need a binding material. And in that case, I use just blood, fresh blood drawn from a non-cannulated vein. And the anesthetist would give me the five cc's. And I will use a few drops of it to hold the cartilage together, as you see. And I will test it when the blood clots and coagulates. So this will be my composite graft, which is cartilage and blood. You have to introduce it in the pocket. This will be my last step in rhinoplasty. And you have only one chance to introduce it. Otherwise, the cartilage pieces will be all over the place. So you stick your offrift inside. When it's full length inside under the flap, you start dropping the composite graft. And your offrift will come out with not one piece of cartilage. And then that's the 18 month post-op of the patient. You can see from the frontal view, if I enlarge it a bit, you can easily see that, I don't know how to get rid of this. You can see that the infratip lobule got a little, the gullin wing, uh, gullin flight appearance that Jack Sheen described. And the nasal dorsal lines are fine pretty well augmented and smooth dorsum. And the basal view, as you see, she was concerned about the soft tissue triangles and that's 18 months and there is no facets in the soft tissue triangle. And the nasal nostril symmetry, which I never promised the patient they would be identical, but I promised them that I will improve them as much as I can. And the lateral view, you can see the amount of augmentation of the dorsum and the amount of lengthening of the nose. Again, if you enlarge a bit, you can see the dorsum got higher and there is no irregularities and the nose got more longer. 
and the infratiplobule columella alar relationships are pretty much acceptable. The key thing that this revision would take an hour and 30 minutes or an hour and 45 minutes using both ears. I would like to invite you for this ethnic rhinoplasty meeting, which will be tomorrow, by the way. So I will be glad to meet Enrico and Dean Toriumi again tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hassan. Very nice counterpoint to the some of the things that, that we're discussing. Um, you know, I use ear once in a while, but primarily when I harvest large grafts like you described, it's been for large nasal reconstructions with forehead flaps and things like that. And um, a couple of points I think you, you've made, and, and I just want to double check with you and, and make them for the audience. And I think one of the, the, the main deformity you get when you harvest a large cartilage graft from the ear is flattening of the ear on the AP view. When you look at somebody, one ear, for example, if you do one ear, it can, you can be deep projected. And one of the keys is when you're harvesting around the antihelix and the inferior antihelical cruise, uh, is to, for me, is to not extend into that lateral projection portion of the, of the conchal bowl onto that cruise to make sure you don't flatten the ear as it settles down. You will get a very small amount of deep projection, as you know, just from taking the, even the conchal bowl, but you won't get as much or noticeable amount if you don't harvest that. Now, you made your incision along the crease, and then you said save two millimeters. For me, I save all of it. I go all the way down to the flat portion of the bowl, but it does limit the amount of cartilage I can remove. So I don't get the kind of grafts you get unless I'm doing somebody who's not going to care and I'm doing a big nasal reconstruction, for example, a big forehead flap or things like that. How do you uh, mitigate that problem or do you not see it when that one ear will be a little flat? Oh, I see it. I see it a lot. Uh, the, the first thing when I harvest ear cartilage, it depends if I'm harvesting from one side or from both sides, because it makes a big difference. When I harvest from both sides, I can get them as symmetric as I want, the degree of projection of the ear. But if I'm harvesting from one side only, I will check both ears and will choose the ear which is relatively more projected than the other one. There was always one ear more projected than the other one if you concentrate on patients. So, and I will tell the patient that this ear will get a little closer to your, to your head. That's the, the price that they have to pay. The ear will get a little closer to the head, but the, the shape and the size of the ear will never change. Right. Only the projection, only the projection will get a little closer. Uh, a couple of questions have come in for you. Uh, one was, and it was interesting how you used the, the dice cartilage with the, with the blood on the alfric. That's a neat idea. You can just slide it in. Uh, I, use, I usually use tissue glue, but that's interesting. One question somebody asked was, how long do you have to wait with the blood on the alfric on the dice cartilage before you place it? And that's just blood that well, you hasn't been, that hasn't been spun out or anything, right? Nothing. It is yeah. just fresh blood. So you have to wait till the, the clotting time. And the clotting time differs from one patient to another. So you have to test it and see how strongly it's holding together. Once it's already one, one piece, then you can introduce it and drop it on the dorsum. Yeah. We had another question about why do anterior and posterior uh, approaches with one side versus the other. That was simply for ease of access during the surgery. Is that correct? Ease of access, so it saves time. I can let my assistant close one ear and I will harvest the other one. If we go both posterior, then you have to turn the head. Yeah. yeah. You know, I must say, Hizam, those are some amazing results from just ear. I, I congratulate you for that. That's amazing. And, and I loved your technical tips on harvest of ear. So if you're using it, ear is very good. But uh, amazing that you can get that much projection and derotation. Thank you, sir. Any other comments? I, I second what Rod said. Really fantastic. and. Uh, um, I think it's important to just some of the nuances of harvesting that you discussed that we just discussed are, are important uh, for folks to understand. So I, I appreciate that very much. Um, okay, so I think that we're going to move on now to our final panelist. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Enrico Rabati, uh, who's uh, in Bergamo, who's going to uh, share with us uh, his experience in a specific technique uh, that I'm excited to hear about once again. Thank you, Enrico.
Thanks, Sam. Let me share my screen here. It's been a pleasure to be with you. And Bergamo, fortunately, doesn't have any COVID in the hospital, at least. Can you see my screen? Yes? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I will be talking of what I call my SPF, SPLF graph. Seems kind of a complicated acronym, but it isn't really. This guy is 41 year old. He's had two previous closed rhinoplasties. He had previously a long nose with a drooping tip. He's complaining of a bunch of things. He has a wide open roof. He has asymmetric dorsal lines, some deviation, a kind of mess with his tip, which is essentially asymmetric. This can be seen from below. They were done both closed, can be seen from the side, and can be seen from the profile where he has an ailer retraction, which is worse on the left than on the right. And from above as well. Now, when I did my full exposure, I saw a conchal graft here, which came from one of his ears and I saw also some retraction and this skin was kind of glued to the dorsum so I just released it and I was able to mobilize the skin envelope a little bit. Essentially I, I really dig love these people widely. This is not visible from this uh, video but it's just wide dig loving everywhere. Uh, I did his septum, it was still deviated and harvested some of it. I thought I had enough initially, but then I had to go to rib. So that was kind of my LSRAT, which I left. I stabilized it at the spine. And then I did my osteotomy, which was in this sequence. First I went by piezo, then I went by burr, because I kind of refined the step off. And then I just green sticked it by an osteotomy. I, I kind of love Piezo for a number of reasons of which I spoke about in the past many times. This is uh, Wolfgang's uh, burr with which I took a little piece of bone which I used. Doesn't, you can't really see it, but it's here to straighten the architecture of his dorsal plateau. So you have a piece of rib here, that septum, that septum, that is rib. And then of course there will be rib for the tip as well. Now this is the creature I'm talking about. It's a kind of hybrid, as you will see. This is perichondrium, this is rectus fascia, and this is a rib lamination. And that's the way this uh, thing is done. These are the splints. I don't use silicone splints. I don't think they're really strong enough to give me the kind of sandwiching I want, although I agree with what has been said before. I had three instances in my previous experience when this got to be when I, when I at one week saw this, saw patients, when I had an escar. In one case, it was actually pretty bad. So starting from that time, I pay a lot of attention and I also put a stereo strip here. Uh, I also use drains in this kind of cases. And his one year post-op, his bones have been moved in. His, um, I, I obviously I use lateral core extended struts coming from his rib on both uh, his uh, alas, and I was able to bring down to some degree his left ala, which was, which was quite high previously. And uh, his dorsum has just this little convexity which suits, in my opinion, a male nose. Maybe a little bit wide at his columella, but not much. So what were the main steps here? I did my osteoplasty osteotomies for bony width and bony shape. I used rib spreaders, they were kind of stacked with native septum, so it's a hybrid creature for my dorsal plateau. And then I did my final dorsal contour, which is what I will talk about. Now, reestablishing the dorsal plateau is so important. I go with my piezo. I used my Lindemann from Wolfgang before, now I use piezo, and then I do these extended uh, rib spreaders or whatever they, they can be defined, and they are already stable because they opposed in the bone. And then I use Sebastian Hack's system, which I find very, very convenient, uh, Nazim. I think it's, it's uh, I know your hand tool works pretty well, but I find this is just superb because of course you can lead the thread there. I do avoid bulk at the neoseptal angle by two ways. Either I bevel 
or I stack, meaning that I use two segments instead of three at this area. So going to the smooth dorsum, my concept is I was always struggling with this. Either I, the shaped rib segment, maybe because it was, I had unfortunate experiences with Jack Gunter's uh, thread uh, K wire thing. And, uh, and then I moved to the DCF, but I wasn't happy with either. Now the rib segment has for me, I know Dean has different way, but the potential warping issues, edge show, that's why pericondrium is used there and fixation issues. This is not my case, fortunately, but that's what may happen with a solid rib case. And regarding the DCF, I kind of played with it for many years. I was tailoring it precisely. I was using it on a stable plateau of just the right width, but it would provide contour and some height, not too much height. And this of course comes from rolling the plateau first and the composite after. Now this composite can be done with diced cartilage and blood. We described this in 2014 and it works to some extent. Uh, Hossam says he's happy with it. I'm not that happy because it, when you put the skin envelope down, the whole thing is a little bit squashed or squished to one side. Anyway, it works a little bit. And of course I did this with my temporalis fascia and the way I did my DCF was essentially precise measurements, which in time got to be a little bit less. They were less than 0.8 to about three centimeters. And then the usual way in which this thing was implemented. But the problem with this creature in my hands was always that although I fixed it decently well, I had some issues, although it was again precisely built, I, and sometimes I also used a, a little suture here to distribute things better. I still had some problems in uh, two ways. One was the edges and the other one was the contour, meaning that edge definition was not always achievable and some contour irregularity may occur. As you can see here, I mean, it's not, pretty, it's not perfect. And I had a bunch of these problems, even in front view. In front view. So considering that augmentation should be an in-between, providing neither sharp edges nor bulk. You don't want bulk, otherwise it's a sausage. You don't want sharp edges, otherwise it will show when skin gets thinner. So I kind of want these things right, considering what I plan to achieve in a male dorsum a little bit wider if I want, according to this kind of structure. So playing with this, I had the idea from Dean because he was using his perichondrium strips on the side of his rib lamination. And then I thought I had the other idea from Nazim because he described this in 2016. So if I put together the rectus fascia with the rib lamination with the perichondrium, without doing the DCF together with rectus fascia, which is what uh, Nazim was speaking about, I will use perichondrium, fascia, and then a little portion of rib. So the perichondrium will have to be just the right size. It's usually about 0 0.7, 0 0.8 by three centimeters. That's kind of average. It will have, this is just the normal way a perichondrium is placed on a dorsum. But my sandwich of perichondrium and fascia, that's the SPF, it will be perichondrium here, fascia here. And then of course you have to imagine it the other way because I will place my perichondrium in the same way as it was placed on the native rib so that it can glue down. So it will overturn this thing. And that's my SPLF graft. Like in a case like this, he's, he's obviously twisted. He has a bunch of issues. He doesn't need dorsum augmentation that much. And once he, this perichondrium and fascia, in this case, the fascia overlapped considerably, it will be put on a way that the perichondrium will be face down as it was initially face down on the native rib. The prerequisite obviously is that this dorsal structure is straight and that I won't go above the distance between my extended rib spreaders, which I had to use on either side. The next step, and now you can see the correct orientation here, 
is use perichondrium in the way that Dean was saying, and that's the way I learned. Stick it down in the way it was on the native rib, put my fascia on top, and then like a hand in glove, stick something in between, which is a piece of lamination, which I choose from the multiple options which have been swimming in cell line for a while. So I will cut this segment of rib, which is a solid rib segment, in the appropriate way. I will choose my right lamination out of these multiple laminations. And we are building a histological study now between the white and the yellow portion. They are histologically completely different. This is coming up hopefully pretty soon. And these small laminations will, I will choose one. I will use, if it's a little bit concave, I will use the concavity down and I will insert this like a hand in glove. And this is the portion where I will suture. So I don't have to transfix by suture the actual body of the rib itself. These segments which are overlapping is where I will lead my 6-0 or 5-0 suture. So that's the way this thing goes. That's a perichondrium below. That's the selected rib segment. You can also shape it if you want a little bit trapezoid shape. I'm doing this recently. I, I like male secondary rhinoplasty and to build that dorsum a little bit wider here in this area. And then this thing will just be exactly fitting in its proper position. Perichondrium is here and the fascia is here. So that's the way I configure this which is in a way a kind of elaboration on the principle that Dean is using of a solid rib segment together with perichondrium on the side. And this will give me that kind of shape, which is the in between a solid rib segment and a shapeless or not sufficiently shaped DCF small sausage, which I don't really like anymore. In a male, I will go to a little bit of a trapezoid shape. I will leave this wider because I have shaped it beforehand a little bit wider. So you can play with this thing. You can stack two of them. You can pull it out if it's too much because you leave obviously open this area. Or you can even put a little bit of DC inside. So it's a very versatile kind of thing. But the key is fixation. You have to fix it until the bone on either side. And then you put one suture here, which does not have to be a strong one. Otherwise it will leave a depression. And the way the suture is placed is by the Gubish arc device, uh, which transfixes the bone in the same way it has transfixed, transfixed my spreader grafts. We just published this on PRS this month. That's the way this thing, I go under the breast all the time. I like a sub incision. That's, sorry, it's in the way. You've seen the fascia, you've seen the perichondrium. That's the rib lamination. I will laminate this rib. I'm sorry, this is in the way, but you can actually see that that's the fascia and the perichondrium will go down. That's the way this thing is built. Thank you. Thank you very much, Enrico. That's really fascinating. I've seen you speak about this a couple of times and I'm, I'm excited the paper's out I've now. Done about a hundred now, it works. I've had a couple of instances, maybe two or three instances, but I'm convinced it's the right way to go. So a couple of questions I have for you. Um, I understand the rationale for the, the perichondrium on the, the underside, as Dean and you have talked about, does it have to be rectus fascia on the outside, or is that simply because you're getting the rib, it's easier for you to harvest it there? Absolutely. Can it be temporal I see, no, I see no reason to give somebody an incision here because yeah. I have rectus fascia. Yeah. The way you harvest rectus fascia has to be a little bit, uh, it, it's, not, it's not immediate. People, when they do it, they will take some of the pectoralis area. So you really have to go, since I go some memory, I have to go below. I, I use my orthric because I really want to go inferiorly. Otherwise, I will get the wrong fascia. Right. Right. I'm going to have you stop sharing your screen just for a minute. Um, so a couple of questions that have come from the audience. Um, and I'll, any 
comments from the panelists would be great. But I think you mentioned this. You can stack, you can stack it in there with multiple pieces of rib. Is that correct? Well, multiple is a little bit too much. I, 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 I think two is okay. Now, you can do this in two ways. Either you pre-make it before, but then you have to pass a suture through the rib. You have to be very careful in doing this. I try not to do that because I don't want the break, right? Mm -hmm. I, have, I have very thin laminas. Or you can leave this thing open and just add another narrower one on top. Right, because you're going to have a limited pocket size. Now, you mentioned, <clears throat> excuse me, that the... The fascia is about seven to eight millimeters wide and about three centimeters long. I have diminished. I did this when I was using my tail at the DCF. Initially, I had mm -hmm. about one centimeter width. Then I came down to about 0 0.7, 0 0.8. Right. That's exactly the space between the edges of my spreader graft. Right. And so your platform, you make sure that does not extend past your platform. Just right. Otherwise, otherwise you'll have unusual it's, looking. Yeah, otherwise, it's a sausage thing. Yeah. Right. It looks like shadows. Yeah. Um, and uh, do you find that it's really necessary to fix to bone if you fixed it to the mid vault very yes. well? I mean, it's not gonna shift. Uh, well, you're right. Now, that's a good question. You know the reason I do this? Because I've had in my DCF things, which were kind of non-rigid, I've had shifts at the radix. It looks just so bad because the profile looks good. And in the front, you have this thing slightly to one side. Right. I've seen other colleagues happening this. <clears throat> now, if, since this is stable, it should not happen, but I don't trust it. So I will put one single transosseal suture. When I did this the first times, I tightened it too much. And then I had an indentation a couple of times. Mm -hmm. So I just let it just right. I, I noticed that when you're with your slices, um, sometimes they've been slightly asymmetrically cut on their lateral edges so that you have a little more of the white cartilage showing on one side versus the other. And what, in my experience, when I have those pieces and I do those asymmetric cuts, just like, you know, it's sort of non-concentric carving, if you will, in that sense, that they can warp in that direction, even if, if it's not in the concave convex direction. Uh, have you noticed any of that? You know, sometimes I do it deliberately. Uh, sometimes I want it to just be a little bit narrow on one side. I, I would not correlate it to warping. Uh, mm -hmm. Although, uh, coming back to what was said before, recently I have gone to the concept sometimes of stacking multiple grafts. And so I, just to make sure in young patients, which are very warp, warpable, I would go to oblique, cons uh, I, I go more to oblique in young people now. Because yeah, I the younger, younger patients, the, the cartilage just seems yeah. to warp more. It's, doesn't have that beginning ossification in it that seems to prevent it. It's a different warping. histology. We're doing a study on this. Yeah, yeah that'll be interesting. Um, let's see if there are any more questions from the audience that we didn't yeah. get to. Well, Go Sam, ahead. can I ask a question to Enrico? Yes. Well, Enrico, uh, if you need a more significant uh, augmentation, you know, as, as well I have seen, you know, your graft is pretty thin. In that case, have you considered to put a free dice card on did it. top of that? I did it, Nazim. I did it, uh, actually, I did it last week. The problem with this, is it's in a kind, it's psychologically not appropriate. Because what I try to do is I get my spreaders on top, above my septum, so I raise my plateau a little bit by my spreaders. If I put DC on top of this, then I may develop a little irregularity. So I try not to do that. But I have done it with a very, I, I developed a little instrument by Marina now. It's, it's like Wolfgang's. And I, I inject this with a troker on top of my lamina. But I try to avoid it conceptually because I want my dorsal plateau to be tall enough to avoid overstacking. But what you do in, in case you need more like five millimeters augmentation? I, I, I cut that stitch out. I put either another lamination or diced cartilage on top. On top? Yeah. Any, um, any comments from any of the other panelists? Actually, diced cartilage on top of the solid lamina would be a little tricky. 
because it's, you, you can do it uh, yeah. with a little troker, but it it won't distribute well, so it goes against my principle. Uh -huh. I think that's wonderful. I mean, I, I think that one of the things that we struggle with when we use non-solid grafting, any type of dice cartilage, is the getting the good definition on the local <laughs> static lines, which is precisely what you pointed out. And I think this is an interesting idea. I'm kind of anxious to maybe try it. I do think, uh, as was pointed out by Nazem, it may be harder to get the amount of augmentation that sometimes is necessary, but maybe there are ways around that. Uh, but uh, as a top layer, I think that's very interesting. And, and thank you very much for that contribution. I think it's going to be something interesting that we can all try. And, you know, as usual, when, I, when I'm uh, around you guys, even if it's virtually, I learn a lot. I'm sure that our, uh, our attendees, which was up to almost 500 at one point, uh, learned a lot as well. I want to thank all of you, uh, Rod, Dean, Hossam, Nazim, uh, and Enrico, for joining us for this panel. I want to thank a uh, special thanks to Sachi for taking her Saturday morning here in California to set this up and run this. Uh, I hope you all stay safe. Thank you for your contributions, and I look forward to the time when we can all be together again. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Take care. Sir. Thanks, Sam. Thank it was great. Thank you, sir. Yeah, safe. Be safe. Goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.